So uh, as a quick review, uh, we have talked about three poems or four poems uh, dealing with ma uh, modern society. Uh, actually, Mending Wall, uh, very symbolically, uh, was published uh, at the beginning of World War I, yeah, 19, 1914. Okay, so I think that um, at the time when um, Robert Frost wrote this poem, I believe you have read Robert Frost's poem. Uh, like because I could, uh, the road not taken. Yes, uh, yeah, that's that's by Robert Frost. Yeah. Uh, so at the time when um, uh, Robert Frost wrote this poem, uh, he might have the world in nature in mind, but now when we read the poem, we can see so many different kinds of walls uh, in human society. You know. So I think this is why. Um, uh, a simple poem like this, you know, can be uh, can have resonances, just your ying can can have resonances here and there in our life. You know, the more you read it, the more you'll find meanings out of it. Okay, now this also has to may may have to do with the way you deal with your neighbors, the way you deal with your roommates. You know, if you live in the same dorm in the same room, then where is the wall? You know, whether we can properly set a wall there. Yeah. Okay, um, and uh, so now let's move on to the fourth one. And I think Harlem, uh, by comparison, um, is written uh, a bit later in the 50s, uh, after the Second World War. Okay, and uh, that makes uh, Harlem different. Also, uh, it's different because a bit like uh, how Robert Hayden's uh, Those Winter Sundays uh, is different from the other modern poetry. You know, because uh, of the poet's position, uh, Lansing Hugh, being a black writer, wait, uh, being a black writer, um, uh, looks at society in different ways. You know, if uh, Robert Frost can look at human boundary from a kind of neutral position, then uh, Lansing Hugh or Ro uh, Robert Hayden or uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, they look at inequality or human boundaries. You know, from a disadvantaged position. In other words, uh, they have uh, personally experienced inequalities, so the issue of boundaries becomes more poignant, 比较尖锐, uh, for them. Okay. So the question here, uh, basically, the poem describes dream, a dream deferred, 就是一个被延迟的梦想, uh, uh, the dream that has never been, uh, has always been put off. That has not yet been realized. Okay, and then he said that he, the 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 speaker in the poem asked, uh, "What happened when the dream deferred? When the dream is deferred, uh, uh, will this happen? Will that happen?" You no. Know, so there, uh, the poem is composed of a sequence of rhetorical questions. But as you read through the poem and read through the similes used, uh, it's this is a little bit uh, like uh, the poem metaphor. You, you get to see more and more meanings out of the metaphor in ma the metaphor is in metaphor, and then the similar is in Harlem in this poem Harlem. Okay, so um, basically, you I think the, uh, you need to understand the progression of the poem in uh, in ideas through the similes, and then once you know more about Harlem, what Harlem means, then I think you know more uh, what the poem is about. You know why it ends. Uh, uh, in such a shocking way, yeah. Okay, so let me read a poem for you. Uh, Harlem, uh, what happens to a dream defer? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or faster like a sore and then run? Does it stink like a rotten meat? You know, I don't, I cannot have rotten meat here or a terrible faster, you know, presented here. But you can imagine them, okay. You know, really, <laughs> you know, if you Google for the actual images, uh, the actual images can be uh, a lot harsher. Or, or crust and sugar over like a syrup of sweet. Maybe it just sag like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Okay. So basically, uh, this is a sequence of images or metaphors uh, for the speaker to ask. Uh, of the consequences of not being able to realize a dream, okay, and you can talk about it in terms of any dream 
But then you can also talk about it in terms of American dream. You know, because the uh, American dream seems to be a dream that all the immigrants, uh, early immigrants who went to the States hold and then get realized. You know, a lot of early immigrants, uh, they do get to, they did get to realize their American dreams. Although the American dream is, uh, has two sides, the financial, the econ economic side, and maybe the idealistic side. But uh, the s story of success, the story of the realization of the dream, uh, is a common one in uh, the history of early uh, United States, in the early history of, of the United, United States. But then the problem is that for the black people, you know, they didn't go to the United States for this dream. They were uh, transported there. They were shipped there you know, involuntarily. You know, they were forced. In other words, they were forced to go there. Okay, and when did they start to have the dream? I guess uh, it's with emancipation, right? The Civil War, and that we, we know a little bit about through uh, A Rose for Emily. Remember at the end of the uh, story, uh, the, the Negro disappears. You know, so maybe he disappeared to try to realize his own dream. But the problem is that uh, for a lot of black people who uh, started the migration you know, up north, you know, from the south up north to uh, Seattle to uh, Chicago, New Zealand. Uh, no, sorry, uh, not New uh, Seattle and in uh, New York. You know, a lot of uh, major cities. Uh, you know, they 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 went up north only to land in some ghettos in those big cities. Okay, so I, I guess um, uh, this is basically what. Uh, uh, Lansing Hugh talks about. Let me quickly go over the background and then I'll uh, show you uh, a bit of the reading of this poem. Uh, let me get, uh, show you the background first. Okay, so uh, this is what I meant. Uh, I think that uh, the American dream uh, was not a, a dream for the black until uh, after the emancipation and maybe uh, during the Holland Renaissance. Uh, Holland Renaissance is um, uh, the time, the period around 1920 and 30. You know, this is a, a the a, the short period of time when um, all of a sudden there is a burst of uh, Afro-American culture uh, in New York, Hol in Harlem, New York. You know, both in terms of music and literature. I'm not sure about the other stuff. Uh, I know that, like with jazz music, you know, that was when jazz was very popular and a lot of jazz singers uh, became successful. And then a lot of white singers started to imitate jazz, uh, the black jazz singers, etc. Uh, so Holland Renaissance is uh, the kind of uh, one cultural climax uh, in the history of black culture, uh, Afro-American culture in uh, the United States. But it, it was short-lived. It was short-lived, uh, like after the 30s, and uh, and with the Second World War, uh, uh, there was a Second Depression, Jing Ji Xiao Tiao. Uh, and also the uh, the great need for conformity, and that's when uh, the blacks uh, lost their voice again. Afro Americans uh, they didn't get to um, uh, speak for themselves, and they they tried to um, fit into the uh, white society in order to survive, in order to survive in a wartime or um, in order to find a job. You know when there was depression, where uh, getting a job is really difficult, etc. Okay, so I think uh, literally, uh, Lansing Hugh is referring to Holland Renaissance, how uh, Holland Renaissance was short-lived, and then in 1950, there was no, uh, it was nowhere to be seen. You know, Harlem is still a ghetto. Uh, a lot of cultural workers uh, around the 50s uh, get to be still poor, uh, not socially recognized, etc. But then if you look at it uh, in terms of the whole history of Afro-Americans, you can say that there were moments of hope uh, for instance, uh, after the Civil War, then there was eman emancipation uh, and also uh, the reconstruction of the South. But uh, in that period of time, um, uh, the blacks pretty much stay in the plantations uh, to work as free freemen, you know, uh, in the plantations, still uh, with low age, uh, low wages. Okay, so that's the first uh, like uh, disappointment. And then uh, there is a great, uh, this is what I talked about, the great migration, you know, going up north to uh, the big cities to look for uh, better jobs, 
but still uh, they landed in some ghettos. So segregation continues uh, in the first part of the 20th century. And um, the 50s will be uh, the time, uh, uh, maybe some of you have seen the film uh, Mississippi Burning, uh, where um, uh, they, they started some movements in uh, up north trying to promote equality of the black people. But when the students went down south to try to promote the equality or to pr uh, persuade the black people uh, to uh, demonstrate for uh, having the right to vote, then uh, lynching happened again. You know, like uh, some black people were killed uh, very brutally uh, by, by some uh, southerners, etc. So the 50s uh, is marked by the beginning of uh, uh, civil rights movement. But then on the other hand, uh, the back, backlash, the, the um, resistance from uh, the hardcore so southerners you know, who don't want the blacks to be uh, of unequal status, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the very uh, turbulent 60s uh, with not only uh, the black civil rights movement, but also uh, the civil rights movement of a lot of other minorities. So it seems that after the 60s, now we have Obama as the president. It seems that you know they have their uh, their rights already. They, uh, everything is equal. But then you know, uh, I think that if you look at uh, uh, different aspects, like um, uh, the setting up of uh, Afro American literature as an institution for studies, or uh, the the issue of equal opportunity, etc., you know, or even the um, the income rates. You can still find that uh, most black, uh, more black people are in the lower realm of society than the white people, uh, and black people or the color people. You know, if we don't say uh, just look at the blacks, you know, the color people like uh, Latinos, uh, Hispanics, uh, or uh, Caribbeans, etc., there are more uh, more of them in the lower realms of society than the whites. Etc. Okay. So now looking at the history now, uh, although we have some model uh, to look up to, like Obama or some uh, uh, tennis players, basketball players, uh, um, Tiger Wood uh, as the uh, what do you call that uh, golf golf player, etc. Okay. You have a lot of singular examples of success, but looking at it in terms of the overall rates. Uh, like uh, the income rates, etc. You know, uh, they are still disadvantaged. So I think that's what uh, Harlem, uh, the poem Harlem, still bears some truth today. It's not like dated, no longer relevant today. You know, it is still relevant today. Okay, so um, yeah, then uh, you can uh, let me give you just some clues to how you can analyze a poem. Okay, um, so basically, you know, looking at um, uh, these uh, similes, you know, one thing you need to find out is uh, how they develop. You know, how there is a pattern. For instance, uh, at first uh, we have uh, uh, raisin. Raisin seems to be edible, but uh, raisin is dry up. You know, something dry up uh, in the sun. Okay, and then. Um, we have uh, the apparently edible, and that is a sugar-coated pill. You know, so we have inedible food versus the apparently edible food. You know, uh, and then all the wrong things, uh, like from fruit, like raisin, to candy, to uh, a, a balloon that sucks, to a bomb. You know, so uh, from if you examine the progression of similes, you find out that uh, the disappointment is more and more serious, and the sense of resentment becomes stronger and stronger. Yeah, so as, as I think this is uh, one thing you can uh, try to look at, you know, to, uh, to find out more meaning. Uh, like, um, at first, um, uh, there is a, um, um, the sword that, uh, that run with, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the faster sword that run with uh, the faster part uh, running, Okay, and then we have the rotten meat. You know, so um, the metaphor does get to be more and more uh, uh, serious in terms of the destruction. Or, uh, but then uh, uh, on the other hand, there is a, the maintenance of the uh, apparent beauty. You know, the syrup, the, the sugar coating, you know, seems to be uh, a, a temporary reprie reprieve. 
temporary relief from uh, the disappointment. But then, you know, uh, this uh, sugar coated, coated uh, thing uh, or sweet becomes a, a heavy load that uh, weighs on one's mind, you know, because one is disappointed. And then uh, uh, at the end, uh, one, uh, maybe the disappointment explodes in some violent anger. Yeah, indeed, uh, in the 60s, um, uh, in the black civil rights movements, uh, there were two, uh, two major camps. One led by Martin Luther King, uh, who uh, follows uh, Gandhi in the, uh, in the believing civil disobedience, you know, in the peaceful, belief in the peaceful movement. But then on the other hand, there is a Black Panther, you know, who is more violent, who is uh, also more uh, separatist. They just don't want to mix with any whites, you know. So I guess uh, maybe the Black Panther could be representative of the kind of anger that uh, happened to them after they are uh, always being disappointed. You know, uh, that the, the, the deferral of dream happens for such a long time that they cannot stand it. Yeah. Okay, the last point. Uh, the last point is very easy. And um, if you don't pay close attention to what it tries to say, it seems that it's just a matter of recording, like a journalist recording of what happened. You know, a counting, uh, final countdown. <laughs> it's a final countdown uh, to the moment of explosion. You know, it seems to be so easy. But then I think the... Uh, the fact that um, the poem does not use a rapid number, it uses uh, English to do uh, the counting, you know, makes a number really uh, a kind of pressure on us to, to feel that, oh, it's about to happen. You know, the, the clock is ticking, and then we are getting closer and closer to 120 when the bomb is about to explode. Okay, and then we see people going in, coming out, and then all with a sense of fatality. You know, those coming out will be safe. Those going in will be dead. Yeah. So, so is this uh, like um, uh, this uh, kind of relentless, wu qing de, relentless sense of fatality that the poem is de uh, uh, describing? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, at first uh, we have two going in, two coming out. So it seems to be equal. Life seems to be fair. But then uh, we have a woman in green something, green scarf or green hat, who may have gone in, okay? And then the other person who should have gone out, uh, come out, but he goes back to, to for, for something of his, okay? So we have uh, somebody who is really unlucky, you know? So, so it, it all shows how um, time, uh, the, uh, chance seems to rule over our life, you know? But the, the problem is that, uh, this type of change or risk, you know, does not just happen to these people. It could have happened to us too. Remember, after 911, there was a moment when uh, uh, people are afraid that, you know, some terrorists, uh, so-called terrorists, can can could come to us, because because uh, Taiwan spoke up for uh, the United States, you know. So I guess, uh, um, and then it happened to uh, Bali Dao, you know, somewhere uh, we we used to go to. Uh, Etc. So I guess uh, this sense of risk, you know, is all prevalent, and that's what uh, the poem described. And what is the most ironic here is uh, is the title, "The Terrorist He Watches," because uh, usually we say that um, a man proposes, God disposes. So God watches over us. Now it's not God that watches over us, but the terrorist he watches. 